I'll see, this is great. I get applause before I've even said anything. It's wonderful. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much to all of you for coming along. So, um, as been said, I'm Jonathan, um, I'm from Monzo, and we're going to be talking a bit about the ways that we've used Airflow to kind of evolve our data platform as time has gone on. We'll talk a little bit about the history of Monzo, who we are, the kind of things we've done, and then we'll show you some of the cool stuff we've built on top of Airflow to uh, kind of make our lives easier and make the lives of our end users easier. So, um, Ed, can I click on? So, yes, I said, I'm Jonathan, I'm a back-end engineer working on the data platform. Uh, I joined Monzo in 2022 um, in August, and before that I worked at Anaplan for three years working on their core calculation engine IP, and before that I was a PhD student at, at the University of York, so, you know, the fact that York is just down the corridor kind of made me feel right at home, so, you know, always good. And um, I have with me... Uh, I'm Ed Sparks. I also work on the data platform engineering team at Monzo. I've been there for about 18 months, uh, and uh, you've been involved in our kind of migration from Airflow from a single instance onto Kubernetes over the last year. Cool. So first, a little bit about who we are as Monzo. So um, obviously, um, Monzo are a fully regulated bank in the UK. We're the seventh largest bank by customer numbers. Uh, and we have about um, over 8 million uh, personal accounts and about 300,000 business accounts. We won uh, Best Banking App of the Year. This is this year just gone at the British Banking Awards. And over through all of that time, it was founded so eight or nine years ago. And throughout all the entire time, our mission has been to make money work for everyone. And that began as um, an app with a simple prepaid debit card and has evolved over the course of time into a much more fully featured personal current account, business accounts. Uh, and we even now have started a wait list for our investments platform, which is launching sometime in the future. So really, a, truly a story of kind of, of growth from something that was just started by a couple of, by kind of a few people to now, to now something that encompasses over 8 million users. So an incredible story of growth. Um, and part of that has been data. It's been a huge part of what's made Monzo grow. So, um, and the, really the story of data at Monzo is kind of told in these two graphs. So as you can see, when Monzo um, first started kind of recruiting data people in 2017, there were only two people and three data models. Very, very small. But over the course of time, that's grown enormously to the point where now we have 134 uh, data engineers, analysts, um, analytics engineers, those kind of people. And there's a couple of milestones along the way that have kind of been really important in the way that our, um, our data infrastructure has grown. So um, in the first instance, we started with an Airflow 1 installation that was on a single instance in GCP, um, and it was running hand-stitched together SQL. So there was no DBT, no generation of SQL. It was all hand-stitched together, and that caused about all of the problems that you can possibly expect it to cause with the way it was. But it was a very good platform to start with. And then as the number of models began to grow, we got to about 2020, and DBT was introduced. So this required a sort of full-scale rewrite of a large portion of a data warehouse to use DBT rather than these hand-stitched together SQL models. And after that, and so that was a very successful migration, but took a fair while. And in doing so, we kind of realized that Airflow 2 was kind of a necessity at that point. So in 2021, we migrated the single instance to using Airflow 2 instead of using Airflow 1. Um, and then that allowed us to keep growing for a while until we got to sort of mid-2022, when we realized that a number of models that we were running through Airflow and the sort of some of the inherent problems of having a single instance Airflow plus a single instance Airflow installation were really becoming too much for us to bear. And so at the back end of 2022, sort of November time, we replatformed onto Kubernetes. And that has been the sort of platform of choice for us as we've gone through. So we self-manage our Airflow installation on a GKE cluster. Um, and that has been, that has served us very well and allowed us to scale out to running, um, you know, 8,500 or so models and supporting 134 um, distinct kind of uh, data analysts in various different teams. So, so where does Airflow fit into our whole kind of data architecture? So data at Monzo is all, it all starts from events. So these are emitted from two key places. The first one being our um, all of our backend services. So we have about 2,000 or so microservices that run in the Monzo backend, and they're all emitting events all of the time. And then we also have our iOS and Android apps, which are emitting client analytic events. This is when people click on things or do various actions within the app, you get events for that. Those are all absorbed by our analytics events pipeline, and that does various things like uh, enriching certain parts of the data, doing sanitization, and then they all end up inside of our raw data store, which is inside a BigQuery. Then that's where our analysts come in, and the analysts will write data models uh, and various other Python jobs that take those raw events and turn them into derived data sets. And then uh, we, we, Ed will explain a bit more in a minute, but we essentially run all those through Airflow, 
and then that produces our derived data that lives in our data warehouse, which is also in BigQuery, and then that's visualized inside of Looker, which is our BI platform, which is how we communicate with other stakeholders, you know, kind of the data products that they're creating. So um, I'll hand over to Ed, who will, will zoom in a little bit more to exactly how our Airflow setup works. It's a little bit different to how some of you might be using Airflow. Thank you, Jonathan. So um, as we said, we, we use DBT uh, to kind of define the transformations that build out all of the uh, analytical insight uh, about our users and staff in our data warehouse. Uh, but we need some tool to kind of orchestrate the delivery of that and schedule it, and, and we chose Airflow for that. So um, we're currently running 20, or just 29 DAGs um, across those 8,421 models, and those DAGs are mostly defined around the schedule by which that, that data needs to be refreshed. So one of our biggest uh, DAGs is our nightly DAG, which runs uh, every night uh, and ensures that all of our core data products are delivered uh, by 9 a.m. so that uh, people that uh, rely on that data, uh, the data is available for them when they start work. Um, so I mentioned we use DBT to kind of define it and, and Airflow to orchestrate the delivery of it. Uh, how do we define those DAGs? So we use uh, DBT model selectors. So we've got one kind of monolithic DBT project, which has got all of the um, transforms for the, whole, for the whole company, really. And that's great in allowing kind of flexibility at the development stage. But obviously, we need to, um, some of those models will need to be refreshed at different cadences and things like that. And so we use uh, DBT model selectors uh, for DAGs to define uh, what models should be included in each DAG. So we've got an example here. Um, I think here we can see where we're using a DBT model selector with anything that's got a tag run of nightly and anything down uh, upstream of that. And so what that um, does then is when we build this DAG out, we use that model selector to work, work out the subset of models within the DBT project that we want to build a DAG for. Um, now, at the scale that we're at, 8,400 models, running the compilation in DBT is, is quite slow and uh, prohibitive in the DAG processing. So in order to, to get around that problem, we've added essentially a helper function for building DAGs where you specify the model selectors and it creates a, a simple DAG with one task, which is this kind of build graph task. And what that does is when it runs, it um, runs that model selector and produces a sub DAG essentially of all the models that, that um, meet that selection criteria. Uh, and then it waits until the DAG processor has picked up the output of that, which is a kind of a JSON representation of that sub DAG, and then dynamically um, builds the, uh, the tasks for that particular DAG underneath that. Um, so yeah, the final DAG is defined at runtime. Um, this also enables us to kind of lock the versioning in of the DAG. So, um, when that DAG, DAG build graph graph build task runs, it pulls a specific version of the or the, uh, the most recent version of the DBT models from the repository, and produces this graph and locks that in for the entire run of the DAG. So you, ha you can guarantee that uh, you're not going to have code changes affect the the shape or any of the particular models in the DAG once it's running. Another optimization that we had to add in was. Um, uh, this idea of pre-rendering uh, the SQL that gets run against the data warehouse. So instead of running uh, DBT specifically in these tasks, um, we actually run the BigQuery, a BigQuery um, SDK to uh, essentially just run a query, run a SQL insert um, for each of those models. Um, and we do that by uh, a customization to DBT where we pre-render all of the SQL at CI time. So it runs and builds uh, or generates the BigQuery specific SQL for each model. And then these tasks that are run here, they just pull that from a GCS bucket and run that directly against BigQuery, which um, saves all of the compilation time that you get from DBT. As well as uh, DBT, we also support um, other workloads. So if, if, if you can't uh, model what you need to do in, in SQL, we support um, other kind of um, workloads, Python or other. Uh, and the way we interleave those with the DPT tasks is through um, dependencies defined in the DAG. So you, you mentioned which, um, what the jobs are. So you can see job paths here. And then the dependencies between the jobs themselves, but also any models. And what happens there then, when you start off with this kind of graph that's just got the build graph task and these jobs, which have got like a question mark, an unknown dependency. 
And then once that build graph task is run, those dependencies are resolved, and you get the full shape of the DAG at that point. So that enables us to just serve additional use cases that can't be served from SQL. And then finally, we've got um, an indirect select. So indirect select is a way of kind of uh, referencing uh, a model from a different DAG, uh, where you don't want to pull in and rerun all of the um, models for that DAG, but you want to use the data that's produced by it. Um, it's kind of like into DAG dependencies. Um, and as you can see here, we defined some parameters for that. So you want to reference model four, and then um, basically some parameters as to whether or not you accept uh, or, or how fresh that data needs to be. So if the data has not been refreshed in the last three hours, then wait another thir up to 13 hours to check if that data is refreshed. And finally, if it's not refreshed in that time, if degradable is set to true, then you can fall back to old data. Otherwise, you fail the task and then stop the dependency there. Cool. So one other feature that we've uh, implemented to support kind of scalability and, is, and resilience is retry. So we hook into the on-failure callbacks of uh, Airflow and um, basically analyze some output of the models that have been run and make a decision as to whether we want to um, retry that task or not. And we have an exponential back off and stuff like that. And we integrate with Slack to uh, notify people that the model's failed and it's being retried. As I said, given we run a lot of our models uh, in the middle of the night, this is really helpful to auto-recover um, so that you know, we, we don't come in at eight, eight in the morning and realize that we've lost six hours. So that uh, and also if, if if we get persistent failures then it's linked up to pager duty and the right people can be informed and, and, and come in and resolve the issue uh, also we've got um, notifications on all of our models so as our models complete um, teams can opt in to having the um, be notified to specific slack channels and this uh, enables them to take ownership and action uh, any failures or incidents themselves. We also provide extra t tooling in the Slack message that gives them links to the compiled SQL so they can see exactly what was run against the data warehouse um, and the logs, the logs in Airflow and things like that. So the tooling just helps to really bring um, the information to the people that need it and know most about our model so they can go and resolve it. Um, that's that. And also we've got some kind of more um, Notifications that are more holistic across the, the data warehouse. So uh, one example here is uh, about model degradation. So we analyze um, a model's runtime over time. And if it's kind of like increasing by a specific amount, then we will uh, raise a notification to say that something performance, imp imp performance implications here. And you might want to go and have a look at that. And we do that using um, critical path analysis and predictions. And Jonathan's going to explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, cool. So one of the, so as we kind of scaled out and as the nightly DAG began to get bigger and bigger and bigger, one of the problems we were having was it was impossible for, um, for anybody to hold all of the DAG dynamics in their head. So the level of observability we had was incredibly low. So people would often come to us and say, well, my model in the nightly DAG finished at 1 a.m. yesterday and 5 o'clock today, so why? And all we could do was kind of shrug our shoulders and say, you know, something, something, upstream dependencies, something, something, et cetera. And that was very, very kind of unsatisfactory. So we thought about it and thought, well, actually, if these are DAGs and we have, when, um, as Ed was saying, we run callbacks on all of the successful and failed tasks. So we capture a lot of the information about the dynamics in BigQuery. So could we use that, extract the DAG structure out of Airflow, and then run very simple kind of university level graph theory on it to work out the critical path through the DAG? And so we, man and so we managed to do that. And so what that means is that now anybody can say, it now means that if anyone comes to us with a question like that, we can say, well, let's compare the critical path between today and yesterday. And you can, and you can start to see, well, actually, look, it's this model that took three times as long as it did you know, yesterday than today. And that's the reason why it's slower. Obviously, it doesn't quite get to the heart of why something necessarily is slower. But it's much better to start to focus people's attention on the right things rather than necessarily exactly having all of the answers. And another useful thing that this tool does is that in conjunction with our analytics engineers, we worked out a way to um, calculate the, essentially the amount of potential optimization that you have within a model. So what it, what it will do is it will say, this is how much you could optimize this model by before another model will jump onto the critical path. 
So what it means is that you can say, well, you, because, because the naive thing to do would be to say, well, I'm just going to optimize the model that runs for the longest, which is sensible. But if there's lots of models that are of a similar level, a similar length of time, you don't really want to be optimizing it because suddenly another one will jump on and all your effort will be wasted. So it's all about making sure that we're focusing our, our analytics engineers in particular on which models to optimize so that they spend their time in the right places. And then a kind of extension of this was, well, as we're scaling up, we're getting more and more non-technical stakeholders. So, could, so, and they're coming to the questions like, well, okay, well, that's fine, but when are our models gonna finish? Because that's the thing we really care about, not like how they compute, but when are they gonna finish? And as a result, we thought, well, could we answer that question as well? Because really, what's the difference between a landing time and a critical path? Well, the difference is uncertainty, essentially, right? So you know that there's stuff that's already happened, there's stuff that's happening right now, and there's things that are gonna happen in the future. And so what we did was we basically said, well, if we take the DAG structure, and if we throw away all the things that have already happened, we've just got what's happening now and what's gonna happen in the future. And so what we can do is we can set up BigQuery queries over all of the, um, over all of the stuff we've captured from the callbacks, and then we can annotate what's left of the DAG with our estimates based on an estimate strategy. So what we often use, we use the mean at the moment, but we're looking at things like P99s and all that kind of stuff to get a really good impression of when things are gonna land. And what that means is, anybody can ask a question, well, when is my model gonna finish? And we found that we're getting sort of about like 15 to 20 minutes within the, within the range of actual finish times for something that's like two hours, when you're running the prediction like two hours before the things actually happen. So, it's pretty accurate in terms of like what we're, what we're trying to do. And you know, we're working on refining it. Another thing we want to try and do potentially at some point is to try and um, you know, kind of eat our own dog food, drink our own champagne, depending on how you want to say that, and put that through some of our, kind of like, some of our machine learning models so we can try and make the predictions better. But for now, it's, very much, it's very, been a very positive tool for both communicating to people kind of when things are okay, but also, um, especially in terms of like incident recovery. So when we have an incident, we unblock, we pipelines are blocked, we then unblock them. People say, well then okay, when are things gonna be finished? And before you could just kind of put your finger in the air and say, well, it's probably about this. But with this tools like this, we can say, okay, well based on everything that's happened and now the pipelines are unblocked, this is probably when it's gonna finish. And again, that's to within sort of 15, 20 minutes accuracy. So it's a very, very useful tool for communicating to kind of non-technical stakeholders for a very complicated DAG, what's gonna happen kind of in the future. And, um, and so we talked a lot about this, but um, self-service is a really kind of key thing for us as we've scaled up so that we as a data platform team aren't the bottleneck. So I'll explain, I'll leave on to Ed to explain a little bit about how that works in practice. Yeah, thank you. So as Jonathan said, um, I guess as the, as the discipline's been growing, there's more and more data analysts at Monzo, we were finding as a data engineering team, we were getting more and more questions about you know, what's happening with my model, why hasn't it landed, blah, 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 those sorts of things. And um, you know, we were directing people to the Airflow UI, but it wasn't tool, tooling that they were familiar with. Uh, and also there was, they were having to work quite hard to find the answers of the things they were looking for. So what we built out was uh, a Slack bot, an integration with Slack that allows, uh, or in which we could design some kind of more focused use cases and in a tooling that the data analysts are more familiar with and use every day for communications. So here we've got, um, the, the Slack bot, you can check the status of a model, you can get extra contextual information, so it shows you the last two DAG runs and um, the, the status of those. You can link through to the logs, you can link through to the compiled SQL, and just brings all of that information directly to the, to the people that need it quicker uh, and without involving us. We've also um, got the ability to clear task instances through this app, and uh, whilst again, you can do that through the Airflow UI, what we wanted to do, because it can be quite a destructive action, we wanted to be able to pr provide some multi-party auth authorization on that. And so by bringing that into our Slack app and uh, back-end services that support that, we were able to do that so that everything's audited and we can um, make sure that it's uh, authorized before it goes through because it can be potentially quite costly uh, if, um, you know, it, 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 if that's run in error. Um, and yeah, as Jonathan said, uh, the tooling around the um, Landing times can also be requested through this tooling now as well. So when we first launched that, it was everyone was really excited about it. We were posting updates every morning on Slack, but it was like, well, can't we do this ourselves? So through this um, model view, you can go and uh, find your model and then click a button to say, you know, when's the expected landing time for this? And um, you get a message back in Slack to, to let you know. So it's uh, about kind of self-serve 
uh, and allowing the people that need the information to, to get it for themselves. Cool, and, and finally, uh, just to kind of go over, uh, I don't think it's the end of the journey for us uh, and our, as we scale, so we've still got a few um, key bottlenecks. The, the single um, monolithic DBT project does slow us down, that, that idea of pre-rendering the SQL uh, as a CI step, uh, it, it takes quite a long time and it's only going to get worse uh, as the organization grows. So we need to look at, you know, how can we kind of decentralize that and break up that monolithic DBT project. There have been some really interesting talks uh, this week around, um, you know, the, the idea of data mesh and things like that. So something for us to look at there. We also would like to upgrade um, DBT to get um, some, some new features and start to like maybe build in um, some of those uh, ad hoc workflows, the non-SQL workflows, like Python workflows, into into DBT, so that the developer experience can be very similar to the, what happens in production. Um, we want to upgrade Airflow from 2.3.4 um, to get all the benefits of the new features. We've heard lots of new features this week, and it seems like the kind of cadence of delivery of those features is increasing. So it's be really good to be able to um, benefit from those. I think one of the things that's holding us back at the moment there is. Um, integration testing and checking that you know upgrading isn't going to break anything so we need to work on that um, and you've also heard interesting stuff about cosmos and dbt integrations with airflow so we're definitely going to take that away and see if um, you know that can provide some extra benefit for us there and then um, as i said uh, our um, kubernetes instance for airflow at the moment is fairly fixed in its resourcing but our workloads are quite spiky so we have very busy in the middle of the night when we're working through that nightly dag and then very quiet at other times at the moment it's kind of scaled up to support that um, uh, so we can get some benefit and cost by uh, auto scaling that's required and then finally deferrable operators and triggers a lot of our work is async so we're using the bigquery sdks to run queries bigquery is doing all the work there so we don't need to have open connections to, to do that and um, so we're going to look into those new features as well so that's uh, pretty much us, unless anyone has any questions. And I think Jonathan's got some stickers to hang out as well, hand out as well. Yeah, feel free to come grab me for stickers after this. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you very much for the talk. It was brilliant. Um, I noticed you were mentioning one of the examples, custom referencing. And I wonder if you guys tried uh, data sets and data sets, uh, data where scheduling using Airflow when you have a DAG that produces some models and then you have other DAGs that would consume from that. Um, yeah. yeah, so it is, it is something we've thought about. The thing with indirect select is that it's a lot more general than the, d than the data sets concept because essentially what you're saying with indirect select is look at this table and, and then tell me if that's updated or not. So that table could be being fulfilled by anything. It doesn't really matter. It's an, in a lot of cases, some of, some of those are the products inside of DAGs, but some of them are like things like third-party processes or other APIs. So data sets would solve some of it potentially, but not all of it, which, would, which, is, kind of where the, which is kind of why we haven't necessarily moved on to that yet. Um, are you using GB2 sources to represent those things in any sense? Sorry, so again, I didn't quite... GB2 sources. Uh, yeah. No, not at the moment. That is something we probably that is something we want to look into, though. Yes. In Let's catch up after. Yeah, definitely. One of yeah, the yeah. developers of Cosmos, I'm based in London as well. Oh, very nice. Um, yeah, very good. Excellent. And yes, we've been thinking about perhaps using sensors for integrating with sources in GPT. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good work. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Cool. Really appreciate the presentation. That's thank you. Awesome.